Good afternoon and welcome to the Institute for Church Leadership. Hope you're doing well this morning. Uh, thanks for being here. If you're watching online, uh, either live or later, thanks for uh, being with us. Hope this is beneficial to you. Uh, it's a little gloomy this morning. Uh, the weather here in Omaha, of course, uh, but also across the country uh, in response to, that's how I feel in response to the, the, the recent tragedy in Las Vegas. It, it's, you know, it's hard for us to even know what to think, say, or, or do. Um, but I, I do believe the one thing that we're all, you know, we're all asking, um, why, why does this happen? How do we respond? What, what do we do? But what's the solution, you know, on the bigger scale to uh, this widespread issue of, of mass shootings and, and evil in the world? And um, I really think that what we're talking about, not just today, but in general, the, the local church is the only answer to this. And by that, I just mean that uh, it is local churches and the hope of the gospel that will uh, give people hope and give people uh, the chance to um, know Jesus and, and change their life in a way that would keep them from doing something like this. And so um, if you're uh, studying to be a church leader, our church leader now, uh, this is a moment to lean in, right? And, th and this is why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, it's why we do the Institute for Church Leadership, to prepare you to lead in a way that would bring light and hope to the world and to reach people who are far from God. Uh, that is the only solution, and uh, I think, um, uh, you know, th this is why I love what we do and why I love being a part of it. Uh, so if we could just take a moment, though, and pray together, um, uh, that would be, I think, uh, a, a good thing to do. Let's, let's pause a moment. God, it's hard to know uh, what to say or how to pray in a moment like this, but we do want to ask for your peace and grace to be overwhelming in the lives uh, of those who are affected by this tragedy in any way. Uh, victims, families, injured, uh, those responding, uh, medical staff, pastors and churches in the area. Lord, we ask that you uh, go before them, or we, we know you will, and ask that you would quickly use this to, to um, in a way that would would uh, bring redemption uh, and hope to our world that is uh, lost and hurting. So God, we're grateful for you, for your son Jesus, because it is the only thing to look to in moments like this. So thank you for your son Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Um, I want to uh, I want to transition quickly because here's the thing uh, that um, the weather and the the current uh, feel around our country is not how it's going to feel in a moment right here in this room because uh, today we have Ryan Leak with us. Uh, it's funny Dylan asked me just a minute ago if I yeah, had a couple of words to describe Ryan, Ryan what it would be and I actually was thinking about using one word. The one word that comes to mind when I think about Ryan is fresh. This dude is fresh uh, and, and, and so many levels. Um, I'm just getting to know him, uh, but uh, I have friends who know him. And uh, he, they've said good things. That's how he got here. But um, just in one conversation over breakfast, I'll tell you what, the dude's fresh for real. Uh, he's a, a young adult pastor at his church. Uh, he communicates on uh, several different church teams uh, for churches around the country, literally, uh, he's written a book called Chasing Failure. He's produced some short films uh, because, you know, what he's most known for really on the Internet is uh, proposing and getting married in the same day. So if you want to go watch his little short film about that, it's, it's pretty cute. Um, but today we're talking about uh, Chasing Failure in a way, his book, uh, which, by the way, is available, will be available in the back. Uh, Ryan will sign them for you, chat with you for a little bit, uh, and um, you can get one of those. I would pick it up. Uh, that's his other short film, though, is about trying out for the uh, for the Phoenix Suns, an NBA team, and not making it. Okay, so spoiler alert: chasing failure, he doesn't make the team. But uh, some lessons along the way. How does that apply to church world? We're about to find out. Please give an institute welcome 
to Ryan Leak. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Wow, that music. I didn't know I was getting the music intro, too. That's amazing. Um, as Andy said, my name is Ryan Leak. Uh, I, I'm from Dallas. Uh, one of my best friends in the whole wide world is uh, from Omaha, uh, Danny Hoyt, and uh, his, uh, the Hoyts, uh, Pastor Bellevue uh, Christian Center. And uh, they're uh, really, really good friends of mine. So there, there's a piece of my heart that's here. Uh, in Omaha and uh, enjoy uh, being here. And thanks, Andy, for, for the invitation. Um, as, as he said, uh, a couple things you need to just know about me is um, probably about seven years ago now, um, I overheard my wife tell a friend she thought it would be cool to get engaged and married on the same day. Now, at that point in time, I had no idea what that meant. So what I did is I, I guessed. And so I, I figured... Does that mean that I'm going to have to plan the wedding? Does that mean that uh, I'm going to have to clue her in on it? But, you know, an engagement is supposed to be a surprise. And so um, I, just, I just began planning our wedding um, behind her back and asking her one question about what she would want in a wedding one date at a time over the course of two years. I'll never forget the first time that I went to a wedding venue and uh, I walked in and I said, hey, can I speak to your uh, wedding person? And they said, you mean wedding coordinator? I said, lady, don't get smart with me, okay? I, I just, I just want to speak to whoever I need to speak to about what I need to speak to them about, okay? So the wedding coordinator comes out. We sit down, and she says, um, so when would you like to get married? I said, I don't know. She said, sir, where's your fiance? She looked at me like I was a rookie, didn't know what I was doing. She said, I want to speak to, to the real decision maker. She said, Where, where's your fiance? I said, see, that's the thing. I don't have one of those. And they said, well, when are you going to propose? I said, see, that's the, th that's the real thing. You see, I'm going to propose the same day as the wedding. That's why I don't have any answers <laughs> to your question. And she's like, are you crazy? I was like, maybe. We're going to find out. I'm a risk taker. Let's go for it. So um, over the course of two years, you know, I'm, I'm planning this wedding behind her back and finally started telling her friends, inviting family. And about three weeks before the wedding, um, the last decision that I had to make was the cake, the wedding cake. And apparently this is very important to, to every bride. I didn't know that. And so they're like, you have, to, you have to figure out, you know, what kind of cake and what it's going to look like. And I'm like, I don't care what the cake looks like. I just want to make sure it tastes good. So um, I, I forget how I, I subtly asked her about a wedding cake. I was in 11 weddings um, over that course of two or three years. Apparently all my friends thought I was a really good friend. And so they kept having me in their weddings. And so... She said, yeah, uh, the wedding cake that I would want to have is, is on my Pinterest page. I said, what's Pinterest? So then uh, I went on her Pinterest page, and she had 242 photos uh, under a section called My Dream Wedding, which would have been great to use two years before that moment. Nevertheless, it was a nice final checklist. So on June 7, 2013, I got down on one knee, and I said, Day, will you marry me? She said, yes. I said, just kidding. Uh, will you marry me today? And we opened up a room probably about this size, and a 100 of our family and friends were standing in there with a sign that said, today. And so uh, we rolled in a dress, hairstylist, makeup artist, everything that you would need to get engaged and married on the same day. Then I had a friend there that filmed the whole deal, put it on YouTube, and it went viral. Well, from there, uh, we ended up going on Good Morning America, the Today Show, and did kind of this media tour. Uh, got a book deal uh, from, the whole, from the whole situation, the circumstance, and uh, me and my wife have a relationship book uh, as well that, that came out of that whole deal. And one of the shows that we ended up going on was the Queen Latifah show. Hey, uh, so we went, we went on the Queen Latifah show, and as we're, when you go on a TV show like that, there is the show before the show. They ask you a bunch of questions that Queen Latifah will eventually ask you. Well, th we practice three questions and kind of our responses back and forth so that they know what they're getting basically before it goes on live television. And so once we did it like the real deal and it's with Queen Latifah, she goes for a fourth question with my wife. And she says, man, do you think that you could surprise Ryan the same way 
that, that he surprised you. And she said, yeah, I think I can. And my wife looks at me. She says, Ryan, me and the queen had like their best buds now. And she says, uh, me and the queen have been working on a little surprise. So why don't you go ahead and check out the screen? And so we're sitting on the couch like this. And I look at the screen in the back of the studio. And on the screen comes Kobe Bryant. And he says, hey, Ryan. Now, at this point, um, I, I about lost my mind, and I started breaking down his words like it was a Bible verse. I said, okay, he said, hey, Ryan. Hey is a term Americans use when they talk to a friend. Ryan, that's me. So I started like, I, I was going crazy when, I, when I, I'm like, how does he know my name? This is insane. And so he, uh, he says, hey, uh, I heard about this extravagant wedding you did for your wife. Wanted to return the favor, so wanted to invite you out to Staples Center. Um, to just hang out with the team, we'll, we'll just hang out. Like, just come, pick any game you want to. Um, the the invitation has been formally extended to you, and I, I'm I'm just like, Bay, you're winning the game, okay? Like this this is like there is no competition. <laughs> like you you are like, I cannot believe this is happening. So I chose a game that was about two months away from the the Queen Latifah show. Well, when you're preparing to meet Kobe Bryant. There's, there, there, it, it's another level. I mean, I've met a lot of celebrities, different people, important people, you know, politicians, whatever. But Kobe Bryant is in the, in the upper echelon, if you will, of, of cele- like even other celebrities are nervous to meet Kobe Bryant. Okay, so I'm sitting here thinking to myself, he said, hang out, not meet and greet. Okay, hang out. Does that mean we're going to get coffee? Is it like a latte? Is he a Frappuccino type of guy? Does he like Starbucks? Are we going to get something to eat? Are we getting steak? Do I pay? No, he's paying for sure. So you're, you're, I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm like, all right, what do I wear? Do I wear a jersey? Only a rookie fan will wear a jersey, okay? You don't, you don't like, no, I, I'm not going to have you sign nothing. I'm not going to ask for a photo. Like, you got to go in and go, hey, Kobe, it's an honor for you to meet me, okay? So, like, I'm, I'm trying to practice how I'm going to meet Kobe Bryant, when, uh, like, in the shower, I'm going through, like, all of these different scenarios. I'm like, man, what, what in the world is going to happen? And I came to the conclusion that the only way that me and Kobe Bryant would have an intriguing conversation is if I was in the NBA. Now, you might not be able to tell from where you're sitting, but I'm, I'm 6'3", and I'm, I'm pretty good at basketball. Uh, I was an All-American in college, which was 10 years ago, okay? <laughs> but uh, I love the game and have always thought about, man, what would it have been like if I would have tried to go pro? And I just thought, well, you know what? Now, it's now or never. So I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and be in the NBA. I didn't even know what that meant. I just knew I had to get in shape to define it. So I started getting back in All-American shape. I'm eating as healthy as I've ever eaten in my life. And uh, one of my friends uh, played for the Chicago Bulls, and he got cut from the team. And so we were playing one-on-one in Dallas, and he's beating me every time, like 11 to 7. Like, there is a clear gap between me and him. I'm 6'3", 195. He's 6'6", about 245, okay? And I'm thinking to myself, if they cut him, they are definitely not even going to give me a shot. And in that moment... I felt an extreme amount of failure that just hit me like a ton of bricks, and I hadn't even failed yet. And I realized, I'm like, isn't this what happens to us way too often? The weight, the thought of failure keeps us from doing anything at all. And so what I began to do is that day, uh, the Chasing Failure Project was birthed. And I, and I said, you know what? There is this long line in our world of people that are trying to chase success I'm going to start a line for people that are chasing failure. Why? Because every single successful person you and I can think of has this in common. They failed. So why don't we just go try and learn what they learned as fast as we can so that we could then move on to winning and having success? So I started going around and asking every single person I knew, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And when I answered that question, I said, I'd be in the NBA. So when I met Kobe Bryant, that's what we talked about. I said, my name's Ryan, I'm a filmmaker, and my, my newest film is called Chasing Failure. And, hey, uh, I'm, I'm going to be in the NBA. Kobe Bryant is, a, is an extreme, uh, extremely focused individual, okay? 
you would have thought he was getting ready to play me in an NBA championship. I'm like, I'm just a fan. I didn't do anything to you. Like, why are you mad at me? But he, he's a very stern, focused, and he listens to every single word. And he just looked at me and he goes, yeah, do it. Then I went, oh, man, now I have to do it. Okay, like I, I really kind of came up with this whole thing so that him and I could have a conversation. So and I don't know if you know this about NBA teams. There's 30 of them. They are multi-billion dollar organizations, and um, they don't allow pastors and motivational speakers to try out for the basketball team. It's not the YMCA, okay? It is the National Basketball Association for a reason. So, uh, so I had a lot to, to figure out from this point because as I'm leaving my hangout time with Kobe Bryant in the locker room of Staples Center, he said, Ryan, send me that documentary once it's done. So now I've told enough people about my dream that I have now accountability, not just from my friends, but I'm like, Kobe's probably checking his inbox right now, waiting for me to send him a link to my YouTube channel. So I'm just like, I'm like, you know what? I, I just, I just got to figure it out. So I did what we all do when we don't know what to do. I Googled it and um, I, I, I figured out, um, I found a website that has all of the PR information, the press information for every NBA team. And I started to email them one by one. And I said, hey, my name's Ryan Leak. Uh, I wanna fail. <laughs> I've, got, I've got this project called Chasing Failure. And here's what I know. I just, I just vision cast it for a moment. I, I started with the Boston Celtics. I said, hey, here's what I know about fans all across Boston. You got a lot of people in your city, fans, Boston Celtics fans that are afraid to fail. And I don't think they should be. I, I think we could pull a lot of dreams off the shelf together. You believe in that message so much, you would let a complete stranger try out for your basketball team. What do you say? It's like, 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 like what do I got to lose? Like, the only thing they can say is no. Like, okay. Like, I don't know you. It's not like I didn't ask you to go on a date. You know, I didn't ask you to marry me. It's like, like what, what, what could, what's the worst that could happen? So I hit send. 30 minutes later, the Boston Celtics write back. They said, man, we love this idea. It's just not for us. I said, oh, man. <sighs> they said no. Then I thought, wait a second. Did the Boston Celtics just email me back? Like, what did you do today? Like, you just start thinking about that for a second. You're like, like, who are you? Like, how did this happen? You know, so, like, I'm like, okay, one team down, 29 to go. I'm like, great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a documentary about all 30 NBA teams telling me no. Y'all going to feel bad for me because I'm going to be sitting in my laptop crying. Like, I can't believe they said no, and y'all going to feel great. So, um, I'm like, all right, I'm going to move on to the next team. Well, in the process, I, I didn't want to send out a blast to everybody because as I began to interact with these different NBA teams, I learned their language. So I began to change the pitch each time. Well, then I, I'm, I'm feeling confident, so I, I tweeted at Nike Basketball and I said, hey, I would love to talk to somebody about a documentary I'm doing. They direct messaged me and said, email John. I said, Okay, so I emailed John. I said, hey, John, uh, I would like to do a documentary with you guys. I'd love to get a sponsorship from you. I'll work out in your gear. You know, I might make this NBA team. We don't know what could happen, you know. And, I, and I, this one I was a little bit nervous because I'm like, this is Nike. Like, this, this is not like you're talking to Nike right now. My handshake, I hit send, shut the laptop, went to lunch, tried to get my mind off it. 30 minutes later, Nike wrote back. Hey, what's your shoe size, sweatshirt size, short size, sock size? Large, large, large size, 12. Who's your favorite player? Kobe. And so, um, so the next day, $2,000 worth of Nike gear showed up to my house. And I said, okay. So then I changed my pitch to the next team. I said, hey, I'm doing this documentary with Nike now. And, um, <laughs> you know, you probably want to get in on it. I don't know if you do, if you don't. And... Uh, the Clippers wrote back, and they said, uh, it'll be a $50,000 permit just to film. I said, bless you in Jesus' name. We ain't got time for that. Not today. Uh, I heard back from, 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 a, from a few teams, different responses. Um, the Phoenix Suns wrote back, said, we love this idea. Can you come on Monday? I said, as in this <laughs> Monday? <laughs> this was Friday, okay? It was like... What do you mean, like, like this Monday? They go, yeah, bring your camera crew. I'm like, 
yeah, me and these people that work for me all the time are going to be there on Monday, some way, somehow. So I go to the video guy at our church. I go, hey, man, uh, I know we ain't talking about. Listen, um, I'm going to need you to get on a plane uh, like like tomorrow because we're, we're going to Phoenix. I need you to film some stuff. He said, well, what are we going to be filming? I said, don't worry about the details of what we're going to be doing and who we're going to be doing it with, okay? Just bring, bring, bring the camera. You're ready to turn it on. It's going to be fun. He said, Ryan, what are we going to do in Phoenix? I said, dude. Um, it's a long story. I really don't even know how it all happened. I'm still trying to wrap my brain around it right now, but I'm going to be trying out for, for the Phoenix Suns on Monday. He goes, Ryan, what are we really going to be doing in Phoenix? I was like, I'm for real. Like, we, we got to work out, like, Monday. And I'm telling you guys, I was, I, I was freaked out. And I'm just, here I am again, taking a risk out in the deep end going, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, and that is obvious. But are you with me in this? It, it's like I'm, I'm, I've ventured out into some deep waters where I actually need God, and I really need him. And I remember, um, I remember standing in the airport getting ready to go to Phoenix, and I was scared out of my mind, scared out of my mind. And I'm going, I, I'm I can't believe I'm being given the opportunity to, to even do this. Like, who are you? And, and I just, I literally said, I said, Lord, I, I, need, I need somebody. I need, to, I need to talk to somebody. What would be great is if there was like an NBA coach or some, somebody in there, something that could just tell me what to expect. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm like, I'm just freaking out of my mind. And I'm literally pacing in front of the terminal. And all of a sudden, Coming through security is Coach Avery Johnson that also just so happens to go to my church. <laughs> and I look, I said, Coach. He was like, have we met before? No. But <laughs> you go to my church, and long story short, I know you think I do young adults at the church, which I do, but tomorrow I'm going to your job, okay? <laughs> so I'm like, I... I'm trying out for the NBA, and he just, for 10 minutes, just sat there and talked with me in the terminal about what to expect. I mean, it was like God was looking out for me all along the way. Then Phoenix got hit with the largest storm they've ever had in Phoenix history. So all of the flights were canceled except one. So you know how, like, you know, if you're ever flying at the airport, there's always the people with their status, and they want to throw it around, and they always give... The, the agents, their reason why they have to make the flight, their, you know, their kids recital, whatever, I got to get home tonight, I got to get on this flight. Well, I go up to her, I go, hey, listen, I know you, you hear excuses all the time why people got to make flights, but I'm for real, I really got to be in Phoenix tonight. She's like, why do you have to be in Phoenix? I said, um, I don't want to say it out loud, but I'm trying out for the Phoenix Suns right now. She goes, are you serious? I go, yeah, I can give you an autograph if you want, but that's... Uh, but but it's, I have to be under the table. I can't do that for everybody out here, you know? And uh, I don't know whose seat she gave me, but somehow, <laughs> some way, I, uh, I made it to Phoenix. I didn't have a place to stay. I'm, I'm figuring out. One of my friends picked me up. He goes, dude, I, I got you a hotel just across the street from the stadium for two nights. Like, it's on me. Don't worry about it. I'm just like, I'm just watching it just unfold. And I'm just going, I'm just chasing failure. Well, they told me that Jeff Hornacek was going to work me out, which in basketball terms is not very difficult, which means he's really just going to make me do some drills, and I'm just going to play for an hour or two until I get tired and with something that I can do rather easily, and then he can kind of see what my abilities are, my, my win, fat, all of those things. Well, I walk in the gym, and the whole team is there. And I'm looking like, what are they doing here? It's like, they work here, Ryan. That's why they're here. <laughs> like, duh. And, and so he just said, get dressed. I'm like, you want me to get dressed after they, they go to the locker room? You want me to get dressed like right now? It's like, no. And, and they just threw me in there. Uh, it, was a, it was an amazing experience. I mean, I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed my time in Phoenix. Um, I hung with the guys, but these are not guys that, that – fit in. These, these, you're talking about the most outstanding athletes on the planet 
when it comes to basketball. They're, they're not good. They're outstanding, which means they stand out. I fit in, okay? Like it was, there, there was, um, it, it was, uh, spe- when I scored once, I felt like I won an NBA championship, okay? Like it was just like, and I had to act like I wasn't excited that I scored, but I was like, I can't believe that just happened, okay? And uh, we, did, we did a few drills, and then uh, he says, you know what, uh, why don't we have you do the three-minute drill? And I, I said, man, well, I, I'll do the three-minute drill. Three-minute drill, that, that, that's fine. Well, one of my friends that's in the NBA told me about the three-minute drill. You just run up and down the court and shoot as many threes as you can. I'm like, oh, great. I'm going to shoot it. This will be perfect. Well, Jeff Horner said, he, he sees me grab a basketball. He goes, what are you grabbing a basketball for? I said, to do the three-minute drill. He says, the three-minute drill is just pure running. Sprint it. Just back and forth. I go, oh, okay. He said, you have to get to the other end of the floor and back. You have to get 30 down and back in three minutes. I said, well, okay. He said, let me do the math for you. You have to get to the other end of the floor, which is an NBA floor. This is not, this is not lifetime fitness, okay? <laughs> this is an NBA floor, okay? Just, just, just in case you're wondering. So he said, you got to get to the other end of the floor in six seconds and then back in another six seconds and then back in another six seconds. 30 times in three minutes. I said, okay. He goes, matter of fact, we're going to put the score up on, on the scoreboard. I said, that's not necessary, okay? Like, we don't need anyone else to know what, what is happening with me. And uh, guys are doing drills, and I'm getting ready to do it. And th- once they put the, the, the scoreboard up to see how many down and backs I'm going to do, they all stop doing their drills to watch me run. I said, y'all can get back to your stuff, okay? You paid millions of dollars to work right now, okay? No, no breaks, okay? And uh, so they, they all just watch me run. And I, I'm just, I'm sprinting as fast as I can. And, and, and Marcus Morris yells out, oh, you started too fast, brother. You started way too fast. I'm going, how is that even possible? Like, how is too fast a thing when the whole drill is sprinting? But what he understood that I didn't was pacing. And so I got uh, 13 in the first 90 seconds. So I was in range, okay? It wasn't, it wasn't embarrassing until the 95-second mark where uh, I couldn't feel my legs anymore. Uh, <laughs> I stopped feeling my back. I was not running anymore, and I was not walking, and I was not jogging. I call it kangarooing. I was just hopping up and down the court. And it was absolutely embarrassing, and I thought to myself, Ryan, why in the world would you have your most embarrassing moment and invite a cameraman with you? Like, it's just like, this is the worst idea you've ever had in your life. So I'm hobbling back and forth, and, you know, Coach Jeff's cheering me on. He's like, Ryan, you can do it. You know, you can throw up later. We got a trash can down here. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to need that real soon. And and I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth, and, and that weight of failure began to hit me again made me go, man, what, why, did I, why did I take the risk? Why did I even think about doing this? And, and what I realized as I kept going back and forth is I kept going past this logo, and it was the Phoenix Suns logo. And I thought for a second, I thought, man, how in the world did you end up here? Like, how, how, how did you end up right here running past this logo? When normally when you play basketball, you are running past the Lifetime Fitness logo, the YMCA logo, the 24-hour fitness logo, but today it's the Phoenix Suns logo. How did that happen? And I realized chasing failure took me further than chasing success ever did. And it changed my life for forever. And that was the day that I, I stopped being afraid to fail. In fact, that was the day I stopped being afraid of a lot of things. And it, it's funny now because I travel the country, I go to businesses, schools, churches, and, and I share this story. And and I ask people, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? And people tell me their stories. People tell me the stuff that they would do if they weren't afraid to fail. They tell me who they really want to be that they can barely tell their friends about, the stuff that their friends usually laugh at. And they, and they, they get done with their, their crazy thing that they're going to do, and they go, so what do you think? I said, man, I, I think it's pretty crazy. Like, you think I should do it? Yeah. You think I'm going to fail? Yeah. They're like, then why would you tell me to do it? I'm like, because you're alive for the first time. I mean, look at yourself when you talk about your dreams. Look how you're leaned in. Look at how you're standing. I ain't, look, like when you talk about just your job, it, it sounds like you're not that excited and passionate about it. So I would rather have a person that is alive and feels like the blood rushing through their veins than the person that's like, yeah, I work here, I guess. It's cool. I'm like, what, what type of person do you really, really want to be? 
Now, as that relates to us today, that is, that is the chasing failure message, so to speak, where it's like, man, what would happen if we just weren't afraid to take risks? And there are two types of risks that I believe that you have to take as a church leader. And whether you are that now or you're going to be that in the future, you can start practicing what I'm about to talk about today. The first type of risk that you have to begin taking is with content. It's with speaking. It's with what is being talked about from the stage. Now, we live in very what I would call um, politically correct times. You have to be more careful what you say today than ever before. You have to be more careful today what you tweet than ever before. You are one Facebook comment away from losing all the influence you've gained in 10 years, easily. And so there is this thing in us that make that is either can be very polarizing or can be, and, and, and sometimes as Christian leaders, we don't want to dip our toe in, in muddy waters. We're like, you know what? No, I'm just, I'm just going to teach the Bible and kind of let them talk about that other stuff at their job and, and let them figure that out on their own, but ignore some obvious issues that are happening in our country. And it's like, I'm not a politician. And so on some level, what I've learned from traveling and speaking, speaking in some of the largest churches in America and spending time with a lot of mega church leaders in uh, my consulting years that I did that for five years, what I've learned about notable communicators and notable church leaders is they have all had a message or a series that was a little bit risky, was a little bit dicey, something that caused a lot of Christians to be mad at them for saying, you fill in the blank. All of them have had a moment where it was like, ooh, I, I, I don't know if I will. And in the process, that is how they became who they are. That is in the process, that is how they grew. And they may have lost some people in the process. They may have lost some fans, but they rarely have lost, lost people in the process. But there, there can be this fear of going, you know what? I don't want to say the wrong thing about certain subjects, so I'm going to say nothing. I would venture to say this. I think it's worth taking the risk. And here's how you do it. Don't just be risky for risky sake. Don't just be controversial just to say, oh, I'm controversial, and I, I went there. I keep it real. I kept it 100 with the church. Listen, don't nobody care about you keeping it 100. But people do need to know you care, and the best way you take risk is you, you walk towards messes, not away from them. Here's what I mean by that. If you want to talk about a subject like homosexuality, okay, you need to get close to somebody that struggles with same-sex attraction, for that to happen, people in your church are going to have to believe that it is a safe place to talk about it. But if they don't feel like it's safe, guess what they're going to do? Lie to you. Promise you it's going to happen. I guarantee you, at whatever church you go to, there is a volunteer or a leader that struggles with same-sex attraction, and they're not telling you. I promise you. And if you were to create a safe environment for them, you might actually get to have a conversation with them. But right now they are in fear that they would be excommunicated from your community if they told you the truth about who they really are. You have got to pull people close to you. And, and here's an interesting thing. And just as an African-American, I can tell you this, as uh, the racial divide has happened and there's been more conversation about racism over the past few years, I can always tell when a communicator does not have any black friends. I can always tell. I go, he, he's not hung out with a black person in years. He's read some stuff. He read some nice books, but he's not close with one black person. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said X. And I can, all, I can tell, I can smell it from a million miles away. And the same thing rings true about homosexuals, pol politics, you name it. People in those communities can read when you've been close to it or when you've not. You can always tell the difference between somebody who in their family has struggled with same-sex attraction. But as long as it's a them, those people over there, you, 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 it'll always be easier to speak out against a they than a us. When, when it's your daughter, different ballgame. It's a completely different ballgame. When it's your brother, it's a completely different ballgame. 
Um, my oldest brother is a worship leader, and I'm in ministry. My middle brother uh, got his girlfriend pregnant 10 years ago and has felt this excommunication from my family. And so while I believe that couples shouldn't live together, it is very, very difficult for me to talk about it because it's close to the heart. Because we're not talking about a people group. We're talking about my brother. It's, it just changes things. It's interesting. If you ever look at a pastor that's divorced, go look at some of his old sermons before and see how he talked about divorced people until he became it. it, it it's not that the theology changes. It's just that we insert in an amazing amount of grace to a situation when it's us versus them. And so I, I would just encourage you, if there is a subject that you want to talk about, I would lean in close to somebody who's close to that subject. Before you talk about it, I would just lean in close and just ask questions. One of the churches I work with, um, he had a predominantly Caucasian church, and uh, he was mentoring a black guy that didn't go to his church. And, he, and, and the black guy said to him, goes, do you think I'm too black to go to your church? And he goes, do you think I'm too white to pastor you? And he said, well, let's find out. And so the black guy goes to his church. He goes, that wasn't bad. I kind of liked it. And I got out of church in an hour. What do you know? It's crazy. And, and then... Um, this pastor goes to uh, the uh, city hall with a, a sign that says, am I too white to be your pastor? And they did a whole media deal. And the next week, two to 300 black people showed up at his church. They said, we want to find out. And now it's one of the most multicultural churches in Houston. And uh, one of the first weeks that he was there, he said, hey, here's the deal. I, I really don't know how to talk about how to refer to, to African-Americans. I don't know if the proper term is black, African-American, Afro-American, Negro. I'm pretty sure it's not colored. But here's the deal. I am, not go I am going to make some mistakes, so can you help me not make them? And he just went there. He just went there and just said, hey, I don't know, but I do know that I love you, so help me do that better. And so help me not to put my foot in my mouth to know what to say and when not to say that. And, but can we just be close enough that I know that there's an amazing amount of grace here, and can we, can we create some, some dialogue? The other day, it was so bizarre. Me and my wife were planning on cooking, and then like some of, somehow we're like, hey, let's just go out, and we're like, we don't have a babysitter, and we like magically got a babysitter, and, and we want, she wanted to go to this restaurant that we've never been to, and I, I'm not an outdoorsy person whatsoever, so anytime the option to eat outside, I always say never. And then, um, but this night, I said, yeah, let's eat outside. And then the girl takes us to one end of the restaurant, she goes, nah, and then she takes us to the other end of the restaurant, I'm like, what is, why is tonight so weird? All of a sudden, the waitress comes, and I see her wrist, and she's got 15 cuts. And, and I look over, and I go, oh, this is why our schedule has been rearranged. This is why we're going to different sides of, this girl's being set up, and so are we. And my wife looks at me, she goes, Ryan, don't. I go, we have to. I'm like, babe, we could have gone to any restaurant in the city. We could have got any waiter, could have got any waitress, but we got her. And most of the time, people like her hide her scars, but she didn't. We got to do something. And so as soon as she brings the water, I go, what happened? She goes, oh, uh, went through a little season. I'm like, this cuss looked pretty fresh to me. Was that season last night? <laughs> or was it? She's like, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I went, okay. I said, what's your name? She goes, Brittany. I said, okay. Then at the end of it, I said, hey, Brittany, you got anything we can pray for? She goes, you're talking about the scars, right? I'm like, sure. If, if I would ask you that question anyways, but sure, tell me about the scars. And she says this, my girlfriend was abusive. Very, very abusive. And it sent me down a path of deep depression. Then I lost my grandfather. Then I lost my job. Then I lost, I lost, I lost, I lost. Now I'm in a city all by myself. My whole family lives in Ohio. My uncle lives in Hawaii. And I'm here and all alone. And I've got nowhere to go. And she just begins to weep at the table. And I started laughing. And here's why. I began to see her milestones of her life and how she ended up waiting on us. And I said, what you don't know is the, all of the milestones that led us here. 
And here's what I see. I think God's got a really, really big plan for your life. And maybe all these things that have set you back, maybe are setting you up for a brighter future. I said, hey, me and my wife, we have to work at a church. We, we'd love for you to come. She goes, I'd love to come. And in my head, I thought, you would? Because if you're honest, there is this thing in us that makes us believe that it is us versus them and that all of them have an issue with us when maybe they've never been invited. You, 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 ever, you ever think about that for a second? But if you're not close enough to one, you always think of it as it is them. She's like, I, I, when is it? I, I would love to come. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I, you would come? Okay, uh, I'm not sure if my church is ready for you to come, so walk in with me, okay? I'm going to protect you, okay? Sit with me. Like, I'm going to make sure that you're, but it just, it changes something in you when it's personal. And, and all of a sudden, I just, I just said, you know, I, I don't want you to come because I'm going to try. And, and I found myself making all of these politically correct statements to try and make sure that I try and correct anything that she's heard and, and fix any. Negative, and, and she's like, what are you, she looked at me like, what are you doing? I said, yes. <laughs> I said, I come. I'm like, I know, I just don't, you know, and it's like, I said, honestly, what I really want you to experience is I, I just, I want you to experience a, the, um, one of the core values of me and my wife is generosity, and I just, I just want you to, to feel uh, God's amazing love for you, and that maybe he set up your entire life just for this night so that he could show you that love, and and uh, here's what I want you to pray about. Would you pray? Would you pray a prayer? She goes, yeah, I'll pray a prayer. What is it? I said, would you pray about letting me and my wife send you to Ohio to your family so that you can see them so that you don't have to be alone for a weekend? She goes, no, I won't do that. I would never let anyone else do that for me. I said, okay, would you work for me right now? So we, we tipped her $250 and said, have fun in Ohio. You don't have a choice. Here's why. Because I wanted her to experience the amazing grace and the amazing love of God before she changes. Not come, change, get on my leadership team. Once you're all cleaned up, then, then we'll, we'll really start rolling out the red carpet for you. I know your first name. I don't care if you come to my church. I believe all of this was God ordained so that you, I feel like God has been trying to chase you down for a long time. That's why I'm sitting at this table right now. It is what it is. So before I get up and make a stance, I'm going to tell a story. Do you have one? If, if you're going to take risk in some of these things, there's got to be something where you've gone, hey, man, should, I, should we kneel or should we stand? And I can't believe have you talked to an African-American football player ever? And I would say this to an African-American football player. Have you ever talked to someone in the military? Could you imagine if, if we as a church were, bri were building bridges and say, man, can we just listen to each other's pain when we do certain things? Could you imagine what that would look like? Is it a little risky? Does it make people feel a little uncomfortable? Yeah, but who can change without a little, un without a little discomfort? And so I, I just, I would encourage you, even especially at, at the collegiate level, I would spend these years asking questions. I would spend these years going, hey, you think differently than me, and that's awesome. Can I interview you? What can I learn from you? What, what don't I know? Can you educate me? Man, and there are certain African-American friends that I have, they go, man, I feel like a lot of Caucasians are racist. I said, I wouldn't go there. I've, I've, I've got a lot of Caucasian friends that are awesome that I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever say that they're racist, but could they simply be unaware of some things? Yeah. But unawareness isn't sin. I would say racism is. But you're going to a place where we're going, no, man, we're going to, we're going to sit at tables and have conversations with one another and just go, hey, here's the deal. There, there are certain things that you've said to me that, hey, I'm not offended by, but I could see why every other person would be. I, I already know who I am in Christ, so it's going to be pretty difficult to offend the person that knows who they are already. But for a lot of people that don't, man, here, here's why that might sound offensive. And it would, 
it, it would blow your mind. A one a notable speaker the other day, they said, man, I got gypped, and a gypsy was offended. They go, I can't believe you would say that. She was like, what? I said gypped. They go, do you realize how offensive that is to us? You, it's awareness. <clears throat> she didn't have this evil intent <laughs> against gypsy. She's just using a vernacular that we all would use. But that's what happens when you invite more and more people to the table. So if I'm you, I'm looking at my dinner table and go, who sits with me? Who eats with me? Who dines with me? And the more you open that table, the more diverse that is, the more things that I feel like it, it won't be as risky because you won't be talking about it them. You're going to be going, man, when I was sitting with my friend, man, this is, this is the pain that they felt in that moment. And, and you, you actually get more intel Instead of going, man, let me just tell you what I think. The last thing that I think you should take risk on as it comes to uh, church leadership, people. People. You, you got to take a chance on people. And, and here's the reality. You're looking at, at a person that somebody took a chance on years and years ago. And, and when they shouldn't have. When I myself today would tell them 10 years ago, do not take a chance on him because of X, Y, and Z. Okay? But they did anyway. And even people that you really don't believe in, believe in them. Even people that you go, their potential is five, change it to a 10. Just do it. Just, just change it to a 10. And, and just be that person that believes anyway. There are people that you believe in that will hurt you. There are people that you will pour into that will eventually leave you. Let them. It's a very, very big kingdom, and you don't own it. Like, <laughs> let them go and celebrate them. I'm glad we had a season together. Don't take it personal, but like take chances on people that aren't as talented, that don't look the part, that can't sing that well, and just believe in people. You have no idea. You never know who you're believing in. You, you never know who you're believing in and just taking a chance on people that don't look the part, that don't have all the degrees, that don't have all of the accolades. I am, I am a recipient of, of, a, of a lot of chances, opportunities that I, I could tell you about all day long. You go, you did what? A month ago? You got invited to speak where? Why? I asked, I, I've almost responded to some of the opportunities I've been given to go, listen, I can think of 10 people you should invite that, that, are, that are way better than, and it's going, no, like we, 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 we want you. And in my mind, I'm like, you're taking a chance. Like, th this is a 50-50 ball for you, okay? <laughs> like, good luck, okay? You want to live with the results, okay? Nevertheless, I'm glad that they did. And so now I, I respond in my life of just giving the farm away. I just, I just the reason I live by, by generosity isn't because I'm rich. It's because so many people have been generous to me. So many people have sown seeds into me. So many people have blessed me. So many. So with my leadership team, at our, young adults, our young adult team and our church team, I'm constantly looking for how I can celebrate other people and give other people opportunities. And people go, man, he, he's, he's not even, he doesn't even work at the church. Why would you let him host a service? I'm like, because he might work at the church someday. And what if he, in a moment of hosting at the, at the church, got the call of God on his life while he was telling people to greet their neighbor. It happens. So I just, I just believe in him, but he messed up. So did you. At some point, which one of us in this room is perfect? How are they going to get better if they're not given an opportunity to play? So I just, I, I just, I'm a big advocate of just, man, taking risk on people. Like, it, the, here's the reality. If you think it's yours to own and it's yours to control and it's yours to fix, well, whose ministry is it really? If it really belongs to God, I'm going, Lord, Apollos, I planted the seed, Apollos water it, God made it grow. So, Lord, I'm going to sow a seed. Maybe somebody else will come along and water it. But the way I see ministry, I'm going, I'm either watering a seed or planting one. But I'm not the one making it. This thing ain't built off of me. No one's coming bec just because it's, maybe the Holy Spirit is drawing them here. Maybe, but I, I'm not going to get so enthralled in it and so much that I have to control the outcomes that I go, well, I don't trust this person because what if they mess it up? 
You can mess it up any day. Just as much as somebody else can. And, and be willing to live with that to go, you know what? How else are we going to get better if we, if we don't create space for people to make mistakes? So the, the two areas that I would encourage you to take risk on are, number one, content. And be willing to pull people close to it. Not, not, not what you read about, but what you sat and talked about with somebody. Uh, and number two, man, I, I, would just, I would take a chance on people. People that don't look the part. People that you would, I mean, you look at the story of David. He was picked eighth. And really wasn't even on the draft board. <laughs> wasn't even included in, in the choosing. He wasn't even in the gym to be picked on the team. They had to go, you got anybody else? I mean, if you're going to beg me, I guess I got one other one that is not worth it. And he's King David. I mean, it, 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 who, who's the King David in your life? Who, who, who is the ignored? Who is the undervalued, the unappreciated, the unseen, the person that is maybe cleaning bathrooms that God has put a word in their heart for your church. If you begin to think like that now and begin to treat everyone around you like everybody's a 10, I'm telling you, that's the type of leader that everybody wants to work for. They want to work for people like that. But for the leader that's going, no, I don't know, and it, then now you've created a culture on your staff of going, am I good enough today to be used? But if you just go, Hey, man, I, I, see, I see people's potential, and I want to help people get there. I want, I want to help my team. Everybody's going to want to work for you. Everyone's going to want to work for you. They're going to go, man, I, I, I love being in meetings with him because he sees our potential and where we're going. I believe we have nine minutes left for Q&A. Are you going to ask me questions? Are they going to ask me questions? What do you want to do? Let's pretend that someone here in the room wants to take a risk on yeah. um, changing something or yeah. doing something in their ministry department even, right? Not right. Now it could be the whole church, but maybe just right. one, one little thing. Right. What do you, where do you start? What, what's your first step? Um, to, to have effective change in an organization, um, inevitably when you have fresh eyes and you're the newest one there, you're going to see everything that needs to be changed okay. immediately because you have fresh eyes. Everyone else has gotten used to the way systems go. They've gotten used to leadership insecurities and flaws. It's just like, yeah, that's just who he is. And you're like, why would you let him talk to you like that? You're like, you'll get used to it after a while. And so um, there, there's always, there's, that's always going to exist. And some people will try and fight that uphill battle to go, no, we need to change. And he needs to change. And she needs to change. I've rarely seen anyone make it up that hill. Right. Ever. Um, but. Uh, the way that you can always gain influence with uh, the top leaders in any organization is by adding value to every room that you step into. Mm -hmm. And so the way you add value is you give them intel that they otherwise couldn't get themselves. And I do that by asking questions. So, for example, if I was doing consulting at a church, um, the first thing that I would do is I would go to a nearby restaurant and find one lost person that has never been to their church. Invite them to come and ask them 10 questions. And so, therefore, when I stand before the senior pastor and says, I don't say, here's what I think about your church. I've been in church my whole life. Here's, you're trying to reach lost people in your city. Here's what one that you've never met said about your church yesterday. So what you've done is you've created a, a tremendous value because where else is he going to get that intel? So even if you're on staff, if you're on a team to go, hey, here's, what, here's where the people are at. So for me, even at my church, I stay out of the green room. I stay out of the back. I'm a lobby person. I'm in the lobby. I'm in the lobby. I'm in the lobby. Why? Because I want to know where people are at. I want to know how, if the medicine we just gave them set in. So if, if I'm in the lobby and I hear somebody say, man, last week's message was awesome. Uh-oh. <laughs> that means today didn't land. Mm -hmm. So what didn't land? Like, that, that is valuable intel that a lot of times other leaders may not have. And so I'm constantly asking questions to, to our people about our church. For example, I sat with a couple the other day. This is hilarious. Uh, I said, tell me about your experience at our church for the, for the last three years. They said the first two years was really rough because we kept having to bring our kid in, into the main service. And she goes, but now, now that I volunteer in kids, I realize that, you know, I could have taken 
my kid to child care. I said, I'm, I'm confused. Why didn't you take your kid to child care before? She said, well, I work in the secular environment, and we spend $1,400 a month on child care. So when the church uses the term child care, I assumed there was a cost. So I, we just kept our kid for two years. We didn't know why nobody else had their kids in there. We just thought maybe they don't have kids. The only reason they found out that child care wasn't free or was free was when they invited a friend to church. And their friend dropped their kids off, and they were like, hey, where's Charlie? And child care, they're like, how much is it? They were like, free? They were like, what? You... So again, when I'm sitting in an executive meeting, I have information that no one else at that table has because I've been asking the right questions. So if I'm going to bring about change, I'm not bringing about change under the umbrella of y'all are idiots and I'm a genius. I'm going, man, I'm asking questions to our church about our church because I want our church to get better at serving people and that their experience is good. So if you add tremendous value to your leaders above you, and I also do that with data, I mean, you, you've got to get data. So it's like, well, we need to do this on social media, okay? Um, I'm not going to say you're an idiot with social media and I'm a genius with it. I'm going to give you the stats. Here are the top 10 posts all time for our church. Did you know that? Here's what people liked the most. Here are the posts that got the most comments of anything that we do. So it's not, hey, your idea is dumb. We're going to let the people, we're going to we're gonna look at the data and say, okay, so uh, one of the things that I started asking for, I, I said, hey, I want to know the numbers of our church every weekend. We've got five campuses. If we're going to make decisions, I know what content was delivered on what Sunday. I know what's landing and what's not landing based off of the numbers, not based off of my opinion or my preferences for sermons or content. I'm going, hey, here's here's our low Sundays, here's, and so when you bring that to the table, you're able to bring about change because it's not, hey, here's what I think we should do. It's going, hey, I'm trying to figure out what is going to add value to other people around me and the people that are coming here, and in light of that, here's an idea that I think will work. That's our day. That's good. We're going to leave, leave just, we're going to cut out just a little bit early because okay. uh, I think some folks want to grab the book chat sure. with you if either sure. way chat with you he'll just Absolutely. camp out back there yeah uh so would, would you just do us a favor though pray for these young leaders yes. and uh and and kind of just close us out by blessing them that way absolutely thanks ryan god i thank you so much for uh the leadership institute nebraska christian college god i, I pray that we would trust you with our future that we would trust you with our ministries that we would trust you with our leadership that we would trust you with the people that you've placed around us and that uh, we wouldn't try and control future outcomes. I pray that we would trust you with it and, and believe what you say. And when you say jump, that we would be willing to do that. And when you ask us to do something that may be uncomfortable, uh, God, I pray that we would step towards that, that we would walk towards messes um, and not be afraid to get our hands dirty. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Real quick. Before I let you go, just real quick, uh, we're back in two weeks with Casey Tigret. Interestingly, he's going to be talking about asking questions, uh, questions-based leadership in an answers-based world. So uh, we'd love to see you then. Bring a friend. Thanks for coming.